Hi friends, I'm Jess and welcome to the Hex Library where I post reading, writing, book, and planner related content a couple of times a week. Today is going to be my Battle of the Booktubers week 2 video. <laughs> editing Jess to explain this to you because I apparently didn't film an intro to this and so as I'm editing I'm like hey you're gonna need an intro. So this is the second week of Battle of the Booktubers. If you for some reason don't know what that is I will link you down below to all of the stuff that we have so far. Basically this is a competition that was put together by Danny at Danny Dabbles. We are on round four so there was a winner from round one, two, and three. I am in round four along with Jolene from Bookworm Adventure Girl, Krista from Books and Jams, and Sam from Samantha Donovan. All will be linked down below along with Danny and this is essentially just a competition that Danny put together. Uh, each round has four booktubers going against each other and then at the end after there's a winner from all four those four people will go against each other and then we're gonna see who's the best book recommender of booktube. Basically that's it. Uh, so I'm gonna send you to past Jessica so you can see about the books that we read for booktuber e so today i'm going to be reading my books from booktuber e the books that i will be reading are just mercy by brian stevenson which is a non-fiction about a lawyer who dealt with a lot of cases in the deep south about the injustices against mostly black people but also people who were poor uh, people who were on death row and he had this a non-profit legal organization that would work on the cases of people that they felt like were unjustly convicted of crimes and then the other book is The Push by Ashley Audrain which is a mystery thriller. That's my bait the only, literally my only basis of knowledge about this book is that I've seen it on book of the month. I thought it was like a, a women's fiction and then realized at some point that it was like a mystery thriller and I was like okay that's interesting. So definitely both books that I'm interested in. Let's say that. Before reading them my best guess is that booktuber E is gonna be Jolene at Bookworm Adventure Girl based solely off of the fact that there's a nonfiction on the list and I think Jolene is the one that reads the most nonfiction of the four of us. That's my guess. I could be way wrong here but that's my guess. When we got these picks we were given four in case we had already read one or if it had triggers or something that we um, weren't comfortable with reading and I almost decided not to read Just Mercy and to pick up the third pick instead mostly because I have owned this book and unhauled it previously and I didn't unhaul it because I wasn't interested or because I didn't think I would like it or because I didn't like it but I had watched the movie based off of the book. I felt like I had gotten enough of a grasp of the information and everything that I didn't know that reading the book would be interesting enough for me to want to continue reading it because like I know what happens and I mean I know it's different because it's a nonfiction and it's about a person's actual life. If this had not been a nonfiction I would have skipped it. I would have went ahead and skipped and went on to the next thing just based off of the fact that I have watched the movie of it. I feel like with a nonfiction I'm getting more of the nuances of the story and the plot and what we're trying to get into what the point of it all is. We're reading Just Mercy. I've already started it. I'm at the 25% mark so we're going to talk about what I feel about that book. At this point again I have watched the movie and about the injustices of the trial that we're the main trial focus of the book but it does talk about other people as well and there is an introduction by the author. I'm listening to the audiobook which is also read by the author. There are a couple things that I would like to say like up to this point at the 25% mark. Okay when you read stuff like this your brain wants to tell you that it's so far back in history that like you know what I mean like it's your brain's like people don't act like that anymore these things don't happen anymore but then when you start hearing years you're like you were alive then <laughs> you were alive when these things were happening um because a lot of it takes place in the 80s and I was born in 87 so were I not alive I was very close to being alive and so it's not as really far removed 
as what I would think it would be. And I, I'm not saying that I think things are better where I live, but I do live north and I don't live in a very impoverished area. So I think I have the privilege to not have seen a lot of those things happen in my area in my lifetime. Not to say that they don't because I'm sure that there are people that have been wrongly accused for things here in my area, but I think it definitely happens more often in places where it is predominantly people of color and predominantly people who are impoverished. So I guess looking at it from that perspective, it definitely does remind you that those things do still happen and are still happening today. And the overall look at the justice system, I don't have the forgiveness in my heart that um, the author has or that a lot of the people who have read these books have. I, I don't have that. I don't have... They talk about the, the, the justice system overall as or let me let me not even say the justice system the prison system as it being this thing where it's never good like the way that they talk about it, like it's never good it never does anything it never solves anything it only makes people worse it only does xyz whatever and for me having known people that some of these crimes have been committed against like I know people who, you know, were children who were molested or raped or whatever the case may be. And so for me, I don't, I don't have no problem with those people no longer existing. Let's say that. Let's, that's the politest way I can say it. I feel like if you are a child rapist, there's no reason for you to take up air from the, everybody else on the planet. That's just me. That's just me. That, I mean, that's how I feel. And if you disagree, that's fine. But the way that they talk about it in this book, you know, they're basically saying that, you know, people can be reformed and people are not all bad and we shouldn't blame people for their whole life for this thing that they did at one point or they shouldn't, we shouldn't hold them back from the rest of their life based off of one thing that happened. And that's a very case by case thing for me, like extremely case by case. I agree that the people that we're hearing about in this book and when we were getting into the story of the characters, they're not characters, they're real people. Let me rephrase. When we're getting into the backstory of these people who existed and of the things that happened to them, they are atrocities. Um, they are things where you know that these men specifically were treated unfairly and unjustly by the judiciary system and by people who thought they were better than them because they were white or whatever the case may be. And I agree that, that is absolutely wrong. I agree that these people should be fought for. It shouldn't be so hard to fight for them. It shouldn't be so difficult to have to prove someone's innocence when 90% of the facts that were brought up in, in court have been overturned. Like you shouldn't have to overturn these. It shouldn't be so difficult. Like there are cases where you find the actual murder, like there's a video of them murdering someone, but the person who's actually in jail for the murder doesn't actually just get let go, even though you know who actually did it because you haven't, because they were proven guilty in a court of law. The, the judiciary system makes no fucking sense. That I all agree with, but this conversation at the beginning of the book by the author who's basically saying that like the prison system is you know stupid and like people don't deserve to go to prison for the rest of their lives you're right they don't they don't need to breathe it's fine but that's just me i will say that along with the i've cried multiple times already we knew that was going to happen anyway but along with hearing stories of like what has happened to these people that brian is trying to save from death row and you're hearing the tales of the people who he was unable to save. You're also hearing stories about the good in some people and how there are people who will fight for them. That, you know, Brian's not the only one who is fighting for these people. There are other people as well who are looking at it as these people were treated unjustly, even when they were guilty of having committed the murder or whatever. They're saying, well, you know, this is the reason why he did it. And I totally get that. I totally see that like what he needs is help. He needs, he has a mental condition and what he needs is therapy and he needs help. I'm okay with that. I get that. And a lot of those moments are really bright moments in the story and you really need that to counteract just like the devastation of what is happening in these communities. And I do think that people, I do think our prison system needs an overhaul. I do think that there are far too many people in prison systems based off of just the fact that somebody was talking about and just based off the system that you know that the people who own the prisons because they're privately owned prisons, they're the ones who lobby to make other, you know, these small things illegal so they can get more people in so they can get more money. 
I, I grasp the concept that it is a racket but I also think that they exist for a reason that could be good if it was used properly. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know what I mean? It's one of those things. It's like if we could just keep people in fucking check, which we can't because we obviously can't. You've seen our society, right? But if we could keep people in check, if we could make it so that prison systems and things like that were used for people who were actually bad, who actually did things because they were bad people, then it wouldn't be a bad thing. However, that's not the case, and therefore here we are. At the 25-ish percent mark, I'm like somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. I've definitely read things that I n remember seeing from the movie. I like, as I'm reading, I can see it in my head, like what happened in the movie and how things have happened. And I know how a lot of the stories end because I have seen the movie. And so like what I'm gleaning from this read is more of the backstory of the people and the justice system as a whole just getting more detail and more information about everything i am enjoying it i'm not disliking it this will never be a five star book for me i honestly should have passed this because i don't typically rate nonfiction. it's going to be a doozy when i get to the end and i have to figure out how i'm going to rate this because i don't typically rate nonfiction. so let's like right now let's set criteria because my typical criteria for how i rate a book is not going to fit for this because that doesn't make any sense so you and i should make some criteria right now while we're here let's base it off of how well it conveys the theme that I think it's trying to convey because like I rate poetry books of poetry off of if they make me feel because how else do you rate poetry you know I, I rate poetry based off of if it made me feel things because I feel like that's the job of poetry and I feel like the job of a nonfiction is to convey a theme to me it's its job is to help me learn things help me understand things outside of my realm of knowledge that I currently have and to help me understand the theme of the book. I'm assuming that the theme of the book is judiciary system thing and the unjustness of crimes that we say were committed by people of color and people who are below the poverty level. So that's kind of where we're going to go with this. Like, because I'm not going to rate it based off of the cover and the characters because they're actual people and the world building because it's our fucking world and like, <laughs> it's hard to do that. This is definitely going to be a different kind of rating. And like I said, I typically don't rate. Uh, nonfiction, but I can I think we can do that. I have reached the 50% mark of Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. Let's chat about it. Right now we are in the thick of Walter's re well it's not even a retrial it's just like a, a specific type of case where we're getting basically they're trying to get the judge to grant a retrial I think. So they're in their um, giving evidence of like new evidence that's come to light or evidence that the original prosecuting attorney put up that was falsified or just not accurate in general or things that they hid from the original attorney so we're like in the middle of that and like going through this trial and again i remember this because i remember it from the tv show so i remember seeing like these scenes are kind of playing out in my head as they did on the television show or on the movie on the tv but i just this is not my way that i like to gather information the way that the story is told it's it is linear to an extent but we're also in the middle of getting this grand overarching story of Walter in his case we're getting these smaller cases as well of other things that um, Brian and his team has dealt with over the years injustices that they had to kind of work against over this time period especially um, in this quarter we're really talking about um, underage criminals um, people from the age of 13 to 18 who are well 13 to 17 rather who are charged with um, capital crimes and then are punished as adults the unfairness of that how it is predominantly black people who are accused um, when they are accused that are tried as adults and then given an adult sentence for crimes that are no worse than what their white peers are performing and yet their white peers are not being tried as adults and if they are being tried as adults they're not giving such harsh punishments. So just kind of going like over the aspect of the ju judiciary system and how it unfair it is to minors and people of color and the poor as we have been discussing throughout the entire book that has really been the theme of everything. And I think it's doing a good job of putting that across but because we're talking about so many different court cases and I, I think if I was more familiar with court um, lawyer type jargon to begin with like it would make more sense. I do know that there is a version of this 
that is um, made like a YA version that's made more easily digestible for teens, which I appreciate that they do with a lot of these like really important novels that I think put um, especially people who look like me into the into a place where they can see things that are happening to people that would probably never happen to themselves. Like I as a white woman would not have to have dealt with the way that these people are dealing with. And so um, I know that they've done that with this. There's another one that they did recently that they did like a YA version for as well. But I know that they have done that with quite a few of these more um, social justice issue type books. And I do appreciate that they are doing that because again, I'm a 37 year old woman and I would like to think that I am relatively smart. I am well read. I do know a lot of things about a lot of things. And I, I'm, I just, a lot of the, because we're talking about so many different court cases at once, it, a lot of the jargon and stuff kind of starts to overlap and you get a little bit confused. Okay, for as like a story structure, as the vessel of the story, if you will. It's really hard to even like call it a story because again, real people, um, but just of hearing this history of everything, it's difficult for me to quite grasp all of the concepts that we're going over, but I do understand the overall theme of everything, if any of that makes sense. Um, one of the cases that they're talking about is um, a young woman who was tried as like a 14 year old and was sentenced to life in prison and she was continuously assaulted, molested, uh, raped by different people throughout the whole process including a prison guard that they that ended up getting her pregnant and then he was fired but never fully prosecuted and she was handcuffed while giving birth so she had this like traumatic birth and then had her child taken away from her and so they're talking about her history and how no one ever took her history into account of what happened to her basically the story is that um she was born to a mother and father who had a slew of children before her and her father was abusive both mentally and sexually to their mother and the older children this person and then her all of her older siblings and then as her siblings were getting older they were running away like they tried to stay and help her but once their father's attention turned to them they were then leaving and then um her and her two closest in age sisters ran away and when they were 13 or 14 they had went to a friend's house and they were like trying to talk, like trying to sneak in to get in because their friends didn't want them in the house. And they were using matches to f light their way through the house and they ended up catching the house on fire and two of the children in the house died in the fire. Though she didn't intentionally do anything, she was sentenced to life in prison and was treated horribly by not just people in general, but I mean, I realized that police officers and uh, correction officers are there to keep the peace but they're also there to protect you in a sense even if you are a prisoner they are there to keep the peace of what's going on around you and that's not a thing that they should be doing it's not a thing anybody should be doing but it's it was a hot mess and so like that story was then put in on top of Walter's story and like learning about um again like all these people that can vouch for him and can say that like he never did the things that they were doing that he was accused of doing and really this boils down to the police finding someone depended on and them, even if they thought they were right, never wanted to admit that they were wrong. And we live in a very unjust world and it fucking sucks. And it's very depressing. And I've cried multiple times for reading this book. So I'm not saying that it's a bad book. It's not something that I probably would continue to read if I was not doing this vlog. It's not, and not for the fact that it's bad, just because I'm a little bored. But that again is because it's a story that I already know. It's a it's something that I already know and I already have the information of and I feel like I'm just reading trauma for the sake of reading trauma, if you will. And uh, it's not fun for me. It's not, a, it's not a thing I consider fun. It's not a thing I do. It's not why I read. I read to escape the real world, which is why I don't read a lot of nonfiction. But I, I do like nonfiction and I, there are s specific topics that I like especially and I do like history. Very interesting story, very important. I think definitely um, more people should read it. I think that the YA version definitely is accessible for a lot of people and I do think that it's an important story to be told because again like I talked about in the last clip, you know, you when you think about all of these things, all of these things having happened, you think about it being removed from history, it being you being so far away from it that it, you know, it's like, you know, the Romans, like, I don't care what happened during the Roman Empire because I wasn't born then. And while I wasn't born when a lot of these things happened, it was very close to, like within a couple of decades. So 
it's not that far removed from my own reality, which means a lot of those things are still happening. And we know that just from existing in the world. I don't know. I'm, I have a lot of thoughts, obviously, because I'm halfway through the book. I mean, there's not really anything that we can talk about that's like, I don't feel like we can really talk about spoilers for this because it's not a story. It's not a plot. It's people's lives. And so it's harder to be this is a, a much harder book to review for that app, for that reason. I definitely plan to finish this in the next couple of days. I'm at 92% of Just Mercy and I want to, I'm having a thought and I want to get it out before I listen to the last hour of this audiobook and forget where I was going with my thought. As you can tell, I've been sitting here crying for God knows how long. I don't know if I want to say I want to clarify or if I want to add on to my previous statements about um, my feelings about prison sentences and death penalties and things of that nature because I do 120% firmly believe that there are some people who do not deserve to breathe air. I do feel that way and maybe that makes me a terrible person and that's okay for me. I can live with that. There are people who are truly evil and there is no way to help them. There is nothing that can stop them from being evil. There's no changing who they are. I also greatly understand a lot of what is specifically this book is talking about is people who were accused of crimes either that they didn't commit in the case of uh, Walter who is like the main case that we're hearing throughout this book or a lot of the cases that we're hearing actually are more people who did commit a crime whether it was murder or um, manslaughter, whatever the case may have been, but then they would receive a life sentence or a death penalty sentence. And a lot of times they were very young, some as young as 13, um, when they were convicted of these crimes. And the book does talk a lot about, especially with teenagers, because we know in the year 2024, we know that teenagers brains are different than adult brains and they are growing. They have a, a lack of impulse control. They have, you can say that they know right from wrong and, and they do, but they also don't necessarily always understand permanence at that point. They know that there are consequences for actions, but they don't know that some actions have a permanent consequence. Definitely more so with those at the lower end of the 12 to 18 range than those at the higher end. But yeah, a lot of what Mr. Stevenson is talking about in this is dealing with underage people who have been sentenced to life without parole, which in my opinion is insane because they are just children. If you're 17 and you take a gun to school and kill 40 people, that's one thing. You know, getting into a fight with someone and accidentally killing them during a fight, that's something completely different. You know, there's a big difference between making a plan and doing something, you know, just that causes a death. There are two very different things there. You know what I'm saying? Like there's two different thoughts behind that stance. A lot of these people that Mr. Stevenson is dealing with in this book, people that he has helped throughout his career, that especially the younger ones, they were mentally handicapped of some sort. They were typically mentally, physically, or sexually abused throughout their childhood. They did not have anyone to help them at any point. A lot of them were homeless. A lot of them were in foster care. A lot of them just really had this long list of issues that led to them not necessarily knowing how to behave in proper society. And then because they were from lower classes, they didn't have lawyers who gave a single fuck about them. I want to say that while I disagree with Mr. Stevenson's full view of the death penalty. I, I understand where he's coming from and I respect that, but it's not what I believe. But I also respect him as someone who spent his entire career dealing with these cases that would absolutely break most of us. To have to know these people so intimately and her, the case we're hearing right now is a guy that, you know, they didn't get his case until like a month before he was being sentenced, before his death penalty was being carried out. And basically, you know, every day he's talking to this guy who has the mental capability of like a third grader and he's been sentenced to death for shooting someone. Like the guy was fine and healthy after the shooting and had been sent home from the hospital 
and his wife was taking care of him. Not like, you know, the most healthy ever, but healthy enough. But then his wife abandoned him and he was just like left to rot in a bed and then he died. And so this kid is, you know, spent 18 years in prison and then his death sentence is being carried out and they're trying to overturn this conviction or to at least get a stay of execution so that they can give this kid a fair trial because he did not have one to begin with. To have the emotional capability to get these backstories, to learn about these people, to be friends with these people, to care about them, to look them in the face every day, to look at this guy on his execution day and to tell him, I'm sorry, but there's nothing else we can do for you. That takes a very caring and strong individual and I don't have that. That's not a thing that I have. Again, while I disagree with some of the things that Mr. Stevenson feels, I respect him as someone who has really done a lot of good for a lot of people who really needed it. As I said, I've been sitting here crying for a long time. <laughs> while I will say that there are a lot of parts of this book, come back and and you know when I'm done with this last eight percent and kind of give you final thoughts but there have been a lot of parts of this book that I've been like you know this is kind of boring or I just don't feel like the storytelling is really working for me because I appreciate the fact that they are trying to tell this story in somewhat of a linear fashion because that typically works better for me and they're trying to tell Walter's story because again Walter's story is the bulk of the story of this um, because his case took so long to get justice for him um, and then and then seeing his mental and physical decline after. I get very confused with a lot of the storytelling because we're jumping around a lot and I think it would have made more sense to tell each individual story and like like say you have a couple of chapters about Walter because again Walter is th the bulk of the story is Walter but then have smaller parts about, you know, have some form of way that it's grouped together and tell other people's stories through it because I feel like that would have been easier to retain the information uh, and to not mix people together because a lot of the stories are very similar um, because a lot of these cases are very similar. They're predominantly black people who are poor or who were underprivileged and so the stories kind of start to run together at a point and I feel like had they been told like each individual person versus like a timeline of all of the cases that might have made more sense. I understand also from like the story aspect that it, it does make sense to tell it the way that they're telling it but it just doesn't necessarily work as well for my brain. All the respect in the world for Mr. Stevenson. I think that what he and his group have done for the last 40-ish years that they've been around is great. I wish that there were more people like him in the world. I'm definitely not one of them so I'm gonna go finish the last bit of this book and probably cry some more. I was not wrong. I did more crying. I am done now, by the way. There's a couple of things that I want to talk about. Wrap up my brain thoughts and then we'll talk about where we're gonna land at with a rating. That's what those words are called. There's like a post script for this book. I think this was the edition that was done after the movie came out or it had to have been because he discusses actually one of the um the guys that he was able to get off death row and to get um, a release for um, due to a wrongful conviction is actually an actor in the Just Mercy movie. So that to me says it was done after the movie. He mentions a, a person that they were able to get off death row. They, the the last, the post the epilogue postscript area, they do go through a lot of like the cases that they talked about during the book itself and like letting you know like how a lot of them ended up because again the story is mainly about Walter because it the story really ends with Walter they don't really continue on after that other than just to say like these are the things like to kind of catch you up with where they're at to this point in time also probably the difference of letting you know cases that they had um had success with since the original publishing of the book is what I'm assuming. But one of the men that they helped get released in 2014 was the 152nd person released from death row or a life imprisonment after being proven to be wrongfully convicted. 152nd. And that's just the ones that they've been able to prove were wrongfully convicted and to get them released, not counting all of the ones that died that were never able to get the help that Mr. Stevenson gives these people or people that are still sitting on death row or in life imprisonment because there's really no way to prove their innocence 
or to prove that they weren't involved or whatever the case may be. 150 seconds. That's a lot of fucking people. That was a time. Like, so there's that. Looking at how I want to rate this book. Originally, I had said, you know, there are some, some spots that kind of feel repetitive or not necessarily interesting, which is a probably not the right way to say that just based off of the fact that I have seen the movie so I know a lot of the plot points of not plot points they're people's lives Jessica it's just the way my brain works when we're talking about books okay because I was familiar with a lot of the things that happened to these people um based off of that knew that it was going to be a bit weird to rate this also because I don't rate nonfiction. also because I have previously unhauled this book because I didn't feel like reading it would be beneficial let's go with that but I do you think in the back half especially they were able to focus on a lot of things that weren't focused in the movie because again the movie is also mostly Walter's story. You get other other cases and things that they're working on but this the movie is majority um, Walter's story. So I think the back half of this you're getting more into like details and in-depth discussions of other types of cases that he's worked on and um, other cases that his um, nonprofit has worked for. The people that he's met with who, like him, are doing what they can to help through this process. Again, not something I could ever do. I, I'm good at compartmentalizing, but I couldn't. I've had to look someone in the face who was dying and, and try to help them through it and understand and come to grips with it when they are in complete denial. I don't I couldn't do that regularly. I couldn't. That's not something that I have the character or the the heart to do on a regular basis. That's, that's not a me thing. I definitely never got that from the movie so I do think that the book does add to the experience of the, the of hearing of the life of, of his cases overall. So I am going to go with a four on this. I think we're going to sit at a four. Four star for Just Mercy. I'm going to update all of my playery things and then I'm going to go to bed. I started reading The Push by Ashley Aldrin. Um, let me give you a a brief synopsis of what it is about. I'm gonna read this directly from Goodreads, so that's why I'm looking over here. Blythe Connor is determined that she will be the warm, comforting mother to her new baby Violet that she herself never had. But in the thick of motherhood's exhausting early days, Blythe becomes convinced that something is wrong with her daughter. She doesn't behave like most children do. Or is it all in Blythe's head? Her husband, Fox, what a name, says she's imagining things. The more Fox dismisses her fears, the more Blythe begins to question her own sanity, and the more we begin to question what Blythe is telling us about her life as well. Then their son Sam is born, and with him, Blythe has the blissful connection she's always imagined with her child. Even Violet seems to love her little brother, but when life as they know it is changed in an instant, the devastating fallout forces Blythe to face the truth. The Push is a tour de force you will read in a sitting, an utterly immersive novel that will challenge everything you think you know about motherhood, about what we owe our children and what it feels like when women are not the lead. This is a 4.05 average rating on Goodreads. I wanted to DNF this on page two. <laughs> it's not, and no, no. <laughs> um, because this is for the competition, I was like, well, let me read some more. I'll keep going, see how I feel. I read to 5% not having a good time. Read to 10%, still not having a good time. Uh, this is the part of the video where I tell you that, um, and I don't know, I don't think we've talked about it yet in this video, you'll be hearing about it a lot. And I've got a lot of vlogs that I'm filming right now and it does kind of pertain. I currently have shingles, which if you don't know what that is, it's like a nervous system attack that your body goes into. If you've had chicken pox before, you can get shingles and basically, it 
causes like blisters to form on a part of your body and there's like ridiculous nerve pain because your nerve endings don't know what the fuck is happening and your body is just like blisters on top of blisters and mine is what they call a shingles belt which is basically I have blisters all the way from my belly button all the way around my right side to the middle of my back. Thankfully it is not on my face because a lot of people get it on their face. Um, you typically either get it on your left or your right side, on your face or on your chest, stomach area. It's been a time. It's been very, very painful. And so some of these books that I've been reading lately, because I am, have had a high percentage of DNF recently. So I'm wondering, you know, is me being in so much pain playing into that? I'm having a great day today, by the way. Today is like, I'm towards the end of all of the blistering. Um, everything's starting to like close up scab over finally nerve pain is like at a minimal today so today is doing okay but it the past few days while I was reading this I was really struggling so this book reads as it is Blythe's point of view but she is writing it like a letter to her husband so everything she says it's like when I met you we were just starting college and you and I were in this class together and I thought you were cute and you came up to me and asked me if I was interested in going on a date. This is not necessarily exactly what happened, but this is me like just explaining to you what is happening. It's almost like it's in second person, but it's not. And then you're also getting flashbacks to Blythe's grandmother and mother's life which I don't feel like are adding anything to it whatsoever. I think I made it to about the 20% mark and just finally was like, I cannot anymore with this book. It's very vulgar in its descriptions of um, childbirth and just like explaining, like, first off, I have zero interest in being a mother. And what's interesting is reading these comments, reading the comments from people who are mothers who are saying like, maybe if you didn't like children, you would like this book. And I'm like, no, I have zero interest in having children and I hate this book. Um, <laughs> please no, don't make me. But it's just like, goes into very descriptive details of like how much, um, how much she hated her pregnancy and her childbirth and, and like the baby being a newborn and like describing like the ways that giving birth changed her body and I, I grasp the concept that the fact that women give birth and and like have a human child is miraculous on many levels even though it's just like normal life it fucking sucks you know like it's not something that I would ever choose to do so ugh, I don't like children I don't want small children gross okay so like for me I was like maybe if I liked kids this would be more interesting for me. But I don't know that that's the case. And I just really was not, ha like, to me it's, it's, it's sold as like this mystery thriller and yet nothing is a mystery. There's nothing thrilling. Um, basically we're just getting that, you know, Blythe is a shit mother because she had a shit mother who was a shit mother. And so it's like, you know, the nature versus nurture thing where it's like, how bad are the mothers gonna be because they had crappy mothers. Kind of jumped into our um, battle of the booktubers chat and was like, are we DNFing or are we not? Cause I know in the first round, I don't think anybody DNFed and in the second round, some people did. And so I was like, are, as, as a team, as a collective, are we DNFing or are we like pushing through? Like what is our, cause I wanna make the playing field as even as possible. I found a review that was like very, detailed synopsis like chapter by chapter kind of like walking through everything that happened in every chapter and I was like well it's said to be this mystery thriller that has like this great plot twist and everything so like if I if I go through this and I feel like it had at least a good plot then I could at least give it like a two or a three you know what I mean like even though the story the like the vessel of which the story is being told is not really my jam maybe it has like a good plot line it doesn't even have a good plot line in my opinion if I was forced to read the rest of this book I would give it a one star so <laughs> um, you know, that's uh, this is this is a choice. It is a choice. So let's see where that leaves us. So with Booktuber E, I gave Just Mercy four stars. I wept. I cried. It was a fantastic time. Except not you. You were here. You know. I am going to say, and I don't remember 
what I said at the beginning because it's been a while. I'm going to guess that booktuber E is Jolene just based off of the nonfiction and mystery thriller Rex. That's my best guess. I could be right. I could be wrong. We won't know until the end of the month. That's my guess. My guess is Jolene. Let me know in the comments below if you have read either of these books and if you liked them or didn't like them. If you've read The Push, please tell me what it was about it that you enjoyed because I'm struggling to understand how this has above a four star rating on Goodreads because ugh, it's ugh, vomit inducing actually. <laughs> let me know. Make sure you check out the other Around Three Competitors videos. They will be linked down below as well as Danny's um, preview video from yesterday in case you missed that and you want to check that out. If you made it this far in the video, leave me a magnifying glass emoji down below. If you don't want to miss anything fun and spooky we have going on in the month of October in the Hex Library, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below. And until then, I'll see you guys next time. Bye!